my topic this evening is uh, Israel's prophetic role. I thought I had jotted something down here. How about that? Perilous times and Israel's prophetic role. Let me quote Spurgeon. We even have heard it asserted that those who lived before the first coming of Christ do not belong to the church of God. We never know what we shall hear next. And perhaps it is a mercy that these absurdities are revealed one at a time in order that we may be able to endure their stupidity without dying of amazement. <laughs> C.H. Spurgeon. My goodness, he uses tough language, doesn't he? So what is Israel's prophetic role in perilous times? And as we defined it uh, from the scriptures uh, last night, in the last days, perilous times will come. So if we're in perilous times, which we surely are, then it must mean we're in the last days. And uh, how long the last days last and exactly what that means I'm not uh, going to try to define that for you. Now, obviously, everybody knows we have a conflict in the Middle East, right? Nobody that hasn't heard of that? <laughs> what is it about? Well, supposedly it's about land. And there is a group of people who call themselves Palestinians. And they claim that land belongs to them. And uh, I might enlighten you a little bit this evening, I hope. I'll probably be referring to Judgment Day. I think it's probably my most important book up till that point. And, uh, well, I've got an Israeli retired general and an Air Force retired general. I have a lot of military people, full colonels in the... In the um, Marine Corps and so forth, uh, who uh, seem to think it's an important book. Now we have a DVD called Israel, Islam, and Armageddon. And the Israeli general, this is how we got acquainted, uh, I'll tell you. Uh, I sent him a copy of it. And then uh, about a month or two later we had lunch together. He said, that is the best thing I've ever seen. Well, you see the tanks and the planes, but it's all tied in with biblical prophecy. And uh, he said, that is so good, I want to buy 20 copies from you to send to friends. Well, I said, you're not going to buy anything from me. I'll give them to you. He said, well, in that case, I'll take 30. <laughs> well, he's one of the endorsers. Uh, and um, I don't mention names, but... A uh, member of the Mossad told me also, he said, that is the best thing I've seen. Israel, Islam, and Armageddon, the DVD that, that we made. Well, now we, we've got a controversy over there, supposedly about land. Well, it is about land. It's not that if you give the Arabs a little more, you give the Palestinians so-called a little more, uh, that they'll be happy. No. They must have it all. That's what they said in 1947 when they walked out on the UN uh, in November. Uh, and uh, they said, and the UN said, we're going to divide this up. And the Arabs, all of them, said, you do that, and this will mean war, and it will mean the extermination of Israel which, of course, they, is their intent. And they got up and walked out. <clears throat> well, then they attacked Israel. What do you know? They lost. I mean, let me read what the Israeli general says, because he was there. He fought in every war. He's, was, he's been wounded seven times. <clears throat> he's a bit hard of hearing, because he had just vacated his tank when it took a direct hit. And that has kind of wrecked his ears. Well, I won't read his praise about this, but 
He says, in 1948, when the state of Israel was just reestablished, 600,000 Israelis, that's the total population. These are farmers, kibbutz, seem dwellers, and so forth. 600,000 Israelis faced 80 million Arabs. 60,000 ill-trained and ill-equipped Israeli soldiers. Well, he ought to know, he trained them. <laughs> uh, they did their best with what they had. Of a, a lot of them didn't have weapons. And no one would sell them weapons. Not the United States. Not France. Not England. They had to smuggle them in from Czechoslovakia. Uh, 60,000 ill-trained and ill-equipped Israeli soldiers of a newly organized army, six months old, crushed 600,000, a ratio of one to ten soldiers of four Arab armies. Well-trained, heavily armed, reinforced by units from seven additional Arab countries, and not to mention the active help of the British, shame and humiliation overwhelmed the whole Islamic world. Um, they're God's people. Three times in the Bible, God calls them the apple of his eye. As the, he says, he that toucheth Israel toucheth the apple of my eye. Look out what you try to do with Israel, you nations of the world. Well, what, the controversy is supposedly over land because... Um, there are a group of people over there who call themselves Palestinians. Now you know that that's a joke. Uh, there never was a Palestinian nation, Palestinian army, Palestinian religion, Palestinian language, Palestinian politics. It's a fraud, just to put it bluntly. Well, how'd they get this name Palestinians? Well, they say we are descended from the original Palestinians. Really? Uh, descended from the original Palestinians. Well, let's just track it down. I try to tell Christians to think. <laughs> oh, they're descended from the original Palestinians. And they are Arabs, and they say, yes, and we were descended from Ishmael, uh, Abraham's first son. Really? That's very interesting. Who was Ishmael's father? Abraham. Yeah. What was his nationality? He was an Iraqi. He was a, uh, a Chaldean. Uh, who was his, uh, Ishmael's mother? Hagar. What was her nationality? Egyptian. Whoa, how about that? So, Ishmael's father was a Chaldean. His mother was an Egyptian. And when they arrived in Canaan, that's what it was called, Canaanites occupied it. And you say you are descended from the original Palestinians because you are descended from Ishmael? You are lying. And the world loves it. They rewrite history. Uh, and so long as it's against Israel. Let's look at the Bible. Uh, turn to Genesis. The last, um, next to the last verse. In Genesis 11, and Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur the Chaldees to go into the land of Palestine. Is, is that what your Bible says? <laughs> you can count on the Bible; it has accurate history to go into the land of Canaan. How about that? Isn't that amazing? Now, this is a pretty good Bible, a Schofield Bible. I'm not a fan of Schofield, but someone gave it to me. And it's got some maps in the back. One of the maps, maps says, uh, Palestine in the days of Jesus. What? Another one says, Palestine in the days of the Maccabees. There was no such place. Okay, uh, read a little further here in chapter 12, um, verse 5. And they end of it. They went forth to go into the land of Canaan. 
and into the land of Canaan they came. Now, how can you be sent, descended from the original Palestinians when there was no such place? You got the great, 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 great way back grandmother <laughs> was an Egyptian, and father an Iraqi, Chaldean, and you're descended from the original Palestinians, and there was no such place. When did this name Palestine, well, you'll find it a time or two in the Bible, you couldn't look them up. When, how did uh, this land become Palestine? It was the land of Israel. It doesn't say in when uh, Mary and Joseph fled with Jesus to Egypt, and then they returned to the land of Palestine. Is that what it says? <laughs> they returned to the land of Israel. Okay, well then, when did, how did this fraud get put across on the world? Well, one, around 130 AD, and I just give you the history, we give you all the facts in, in Judgment Day. Document it. Uh, about 130 AD, the Romans, who had destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, they began to rebuild it as a pagan city dedicated to Jupiter. And about 132 AD, they decided to build a temple dedicated to Jupiter on Temple Mount, where the uh, Jewish temple had stood. Well, that upset the Jews. Now, they may be secular and, and unbelievers, but they have a really a feeling for Temple Mount and, and the temple. And that upset the Jews, and there was an uprising. And it was led by a man named Bar Chokba, who claimed to be the Messiah. And for a while, the Jews were, were uh, triumphant. But the Romans, of course, brought in more legions. And they wiped out a thousand, approximately a thousand Jewish villages. Killed a half a million Jews, sold thousands into slavery. And in anger, the Roman government renamed Israel Provincia Syria Palestina. And from that day on, you can check me out. I've just given you history. Google it. Do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, from that time on, everyone living there was a Palestinian, was called a Palestinian. Now, how did, who lived there? Arabs? Not an Arab in sight. Jews, you chase them out, they come back. This is our land, God gave it to us. So for the next uh, 1800 years, Jews were called Palestinians. Uh, let's see if I can find a, a quote here somewhere. I, I don't know. Uh, I've got a few of them marked, but uh, let me see. Well, anyway, I can give it to you by, by memory. I quote a, a number of Arab leaders here, and we give you the documentation again. Uh, one of them, and, and they all say, this is in the 40s and 50s, and they all say, Palestinians? There's no such place as Palestine. If there's any Palestinians, it's those Jews. We Arabs are not Palestinians. How about that? I quote Ahmed Shukeri, an Arab leader, 1945, I believe it was, testifying to the United Nations. And this is basically what he says. We're not Palestinians. Those Jews are Palestinians. Eight years later, uh, so that would be 46, eight years later, 1964, Ahmed Shukari became the founding chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization. They lie. They change their tune. They rewrite history. And the UN says, oh, that's great. We hate Israel. Let's do it. Now, the general that I was talking about, he was a member of, in, in the Second World War, he was a member of, uh, in fact, he was one of the officers, of a volunteer, a Jewish volunteer force. 
it, the brigade. It was called the Palestinian Brigade. How many Arabs do you think were in the Palestinian Brigade? Zero. The Arabs were fighting on Hitler's side. All Jews, the Palestinian Brigade. There was the Palestinian Post, a Jewish newspaper. There was the Palestinian Symphony Orchestra in Jerusalem, a Jewish orchestra. Arabs were not Palestinians. Jews were called Palestinians. Okay, I just want to get that point across. So you understand this is a total fraud. Uh, you might want to get a book, not written by a Christian that I know, but uh, she titles it From Time Immemorial. And how many of you have read that? From Time Immemorial, okay, <laughs> one or two. Well, she just gives you the documentation. Um, where, do you, where does she get the title? Because these people living over there now who call themselves Palestinians, they claim they're descended from the original Palestinians. They say, we've been here from time immemorial. A fraud, a lie, it is not true, okay? Um, well, so this is a controversy that we have over there. Um, God said, well, I was, I was going to raise my hand when uh, Yaakov was saying, well, if it's twice in the Bible, that's important. If it's three times in the Bible, really important. How about 230 times? God is called the God of Israel. Never once is he called the God of the Americans or the God of uh, Palestinians, of course. There's no such, no such people. Or the God of the French or the Germans. He is called the God of Israel, period. 203 times. Now, of course, another dozen times he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, let me just ask you a question. Wouldn't it be very embarrassing to God and to Christians if Israel didn't exist anymore? Think about it. God has gone out on a limb. He has connected his integrity to the Jewish people. Now, they, are, they have sinned and grievously. They are under God's judgment. But at the same time, you better beware what you do to the Jewish people. An awful lot of anti-Semitism even among so-called evangelicals. So these are God's people. They're under his judgment. Uh, you go to, well, let's, uh, let's, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy. You know, you know these verses better than I do. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 63. You know what this book, Deuteronomy, is all about. It's warning the Jews. When I bring you in the land, if you follow the ways of the heathen that I am replacing you with, uh, replacing them with you, I will cast you out of your land. And But notice what it says, verse 63. Come to pass that as that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. You shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. Did it happen? It happened. But he doesn't say, I'm going to just sh shove you out next door. Notice what he says. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from the one end of the earth even unto the other, and there thou shalt serve other gods and so forth. Did it happen? We call him the wandering Jew. You find them everywhere. A friend of mine who is a believer in the Messiah now, a Jewish, I, I like the way he says it. Why do I speak with a Brooklyn accent and love bagels and locks? Because my forebears sinned and God scattered us everywhere. Okay, but then God said he would bring them back. He would, they would be horribly punished. Of course, the Holocaust, and I don't know how many, uh, 
some groups of Jews, as they went into the uh, gas chambers, they were singing psalms, quoting the psalms of David and singing them. I, I rather think quite a few of them got saved at that point. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, I don't know how much their understanding was, but they were crying out to God. Um, but uh, God's judgment is upon them. He said, you will be hated and persecuted and slaughtered and killed like, like no other people. You cannot, uh, you cannot explain it. I mean, this is not rational. Why should these people be hated and hounded and persecuted to the death century after century after century? Why? Well, they're God's people and they're under his judgment. Let me read what a couple of secular uh, writers said. For more than 20 centuries, the Jewish people, more than any other segment of humanity, have been persecuted, uprooted, and annihilated. It is true that many ethnic and religious groups have suffered grievously at the hands of tyrants, but there is a crucial difference. More Africans were killed in the era of slavery but there was no determined intent to eradicate the entire Negro race. A higher percentage of Armenians perished in the Turkish genocide before World War I, but the main intent was to deport them, not extinguish their genetic pool. You know, he talks about Mao and Pol Pot and Suharto and, and, and Stalin and so forth, but they were not intent upon wiping out all these people. Ext extinguishing their genetic pool. But notice what he says. In each of these cases, the genocide was intended to serve a deeper purpose, the conquest of territory, the acquisition of wealth, the enlargement of political power. In contrast, the genocide of the Jewish people was not intended to be a means to an end. It was not attempted in order to achieve a more fundamental purpose. It was the fundamental purpose. This is what makes the Nazi Holocaust unique in human history. Well, God said, you'd be hated and persecuted like other people, but I will not let you be destroyed, exterminated. But we have, for example, you've all heard of replacement theology, uh, mostly Calvinistic. Uh, D. James Kennedy, who I believe is with the Lord now. Uh, D. James Kennedy was one of the leaders in that movement. Um, let me see if I can find that very quickly. <clears throat> well, D. James Kennedy was the founder, chancellor, president, and professor of evangelism of the Calvinistic Knox Seminary in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And this is in 2002, six years ago. They issued it's called an open letter to evangelicals and other interested parties, the people of God, the land of Israel, and the impartiality of the gospel. And let me give you, well, I'm just, I don't have time for one section out of there. This happens to be section nine. Listen to this. The entitlement of any one ethnic or religious group to territory in the Middle East called the Holy Land cannot be supported by scripture. What? What scripture are they reading? I don't know. Maybe it's, they don't have the, I mean, they don't, I don't know. They may be missing something up above in their heads. In fact, the land promises specific to Israel in the Old Testament were fulfilled under Joshua. What? These were, it was signed by more than 70. These are leading evangelicals, supposedly, all, all, um, all Calvinists, professors, theologians, etc. And they signed this document that all the promises to Israel pertaining to the land were fulfilled in the days of Joshua. Now, as I recall, Joshua lived to be 110 years old. Well, look, oh my goodness. Um, turn to First Chronicles. I'm, I'm just preaching to the choir here. 
Uh, you folks know these verses. If you don't, you should. Get Judgment Day, but even more important, get it in your public library. They need to know the truth. Listen, 1 Chronicles 16, verse 15. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. Well, that means forever. Even of the covenant which he made with Abraham and of his oath unto Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. Everlasting in a covenant saying unto thee will I give the land of Canaan the lot of your inheritance. Doesn't sound to me like it was all fulfilled in the days of Joshua. Now, I, I don't know what these people use for Bibles. Go to uh, Jeremiah chapter 23. I, it is so simple, folks. I'm not telling you anything profound. My goodness, just read your Bible. <clears throat> Verse 7. See, for one thing, God is using Israel to punish the nations. And he is going to really punish the nations. But he's also using the nations to punish Israel because they're still under his judgment. Verse 7, Jeremiah 23, 7. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord. They shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Well, that was the big news in Joshua's day. Wow, they all heard, the Canaanites all heard about it. Um, Rahab the harlot had heard about it. Oh, we know about this. That was the big news then. But the Lord liveth. Now, here we got some new news. But the Lord liveth, which brought up and which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country. And from all countries whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Wow. That was quite a revelation through Jeremiah. In that day, it came to pass in our generation. You go to Israel, uh, as I know some of you have been there, uh, some of you many times. What do you find out? They've come back to Israel from more than a hundred nations in our day. Wow. Blessed be the Lord who brought back his people from all the nations. They hadn't even been scattered yet when Jeremiah wrote that. <clears throat> from all the nations <clears throat> whither he had scattered them. Okay, so what, uh, well, let's, while we're close. Go back to Genesis 15. I love the Bible. You are not going to escape the Bible. Problem is, we just don't study it with the right eyes. Verse 13. This is Genesis 15:13. Now, what, what about this uh, Ishmael and his descendants? Well, Ishmael was the firstborn. And by rights, he should uh, have the inheritance, his, his descendants, even though he was an illegitimate uh, a, a child. But notice what God says. Now, how are we going to identify? You see, we've got a controversy, and we have a rivalry for the land of Israel. And the descendants of Ishmael say, no, we're the original Palestinians. Well, you know, that's a fraud. Uh, but that land belongs to us because we're descended from Ishmael's, uh, I, I'm sorry, we're descended from Abraham's first son, Ishmael. Okay, God straightens that out. He doesn't leave you with any doubts. Well, go to chapter, hold your finger there and go to chapter 17. My wife says soon people run out of fingers. Uh, chapter 17, 7. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generation for an everlasting covenant that wasn't during Joshua's day to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of Palestine that's what your Bible says all the land of Canaan for what? an everlasting possession and I will be their God, even though they don't want him to be their God, and right now they're most of them over there. Well, about 30% of the Israelis claim to be atheists. 
Okay, so what do the Arabs say about that? Well, let's go down to verse 19. Here's the passage where God says, I'm going to give you a son through Sarai, your wife, and she will be called Sarah. Okay? And Abram, verse 17, this great man of faith says, verse, how about uh, 18? He said, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee forever. Abraham says, Ishmael's a good boy. You gave me a son. I'm happy with Ishmael. I don't need another son. Wow. How out of touch with God could he be? He was a man of faith, but we are, even the greatest, are not perfect. Notice what he says. Verse 19, God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant um, with him, uh, my covenant with him and, and with his seed after him. My glasses got a little bit twisted, and I sometimes see double here. <laughs> well, no, 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 the, the Arabs say, the so-called Palestinians, no, 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 the Jews and the Christians, they changed that. It didn't used to say that, really. Now, you're going to have to change an awful lot. If God is called the God of Israel 203 times, and he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 12 times, I mean, you're going to have to do an awful lot. Even if you had a computer, you had all this computerized, you've got to go through there and change it everywhere and, and somehow make it not make a mistake and make it fit in. You couldn't do it. But notice, God, you don't have to go to that trouble. God will take care of it. Of chapter 15. Verse 13, you understand? Seed, that's the key word. Unto your seed. Now, who is the seed? Well, wouldn't that include uh, Ishmael? No, no, no. Hold your finger in Genesis 15 for a minute and go to Genesis 22. I love the Bible. You cannot escape it. Um, verse, 20, uh, verse 1. It came to, chapter 22, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, he said, behold, I am here. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. You have to really change an awful lot in the Bible. God does not recognize Ishmael as the son of Abraham. He was not the son of promise. That's not the son God promised. That was the son of Abraham and Sarah's conniving, unbelief, their sin. Okay, so now let's go back to chapter 15. He said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed, this is the seed that will inherit this land, thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. Also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. Yeah. And afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. And thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God is not the kind of a God who would just throw Amorites, throw Canaanites out just to put Israel in their place. God is saying the the wickedness of these Canaanites, because Amorites is a synonym for Canaanites, the wickedness of the Canaanites is not enough to justify me wiping them out. But you give them another 400 years, and they will be so such an abomination in my sight, like Sodom and Gomorrah. I will be forced in my righteousness to wipe them out. And I'm going to use you, your descendants, to do that, and I will give you their land. Okay? So, who's the seed? Were the Arabs ever the slaves anywhere? They weren't even an identifiable group of people at that time. Uh, they got their identity in Arabia many centuries later. Who, who could this be? Well, the Jews, Israel, this is the seed. How do we know that the land belongs to them? Because they were the slaves for 400 years. In, in under the Egyptians, and nobody else was. 
Well, how can we really be sure of that? Well, turn to Exodus chapter 12. And I'm, I don't want to be corrected by Yaakov or David, these Hebrew experts. But um, Exodus 12, you know what that, you know what that is. That's the Passover passage, right? Exodus 12. So how do we know that the Jews were actually slaves somewhere and then they were delivered? Well, we have the story of the Passover and I'm, I'm spending too much time on this. Uh, and uh, you, you know the story. You're going to take a lamb out of the flock on the 10th day of Nisan. You're going to keep it under observation for four days. The 14th of Nisan, you will slay it in the evening, you know, the evening was the beginning of the, of the new day for the Jews. Uh, rather interesting, Jesus had been hiding out from the Jews. Remember, he walked no more in Galilee because the Jews uh, sought in Jew. I'm sorry, he walked no more in Jewry because the Jews sought to slay him. He's been hiding out in, in Galilee. And then suddenly, on the 10th of Nisan, he comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. That's the very day the lamb was taken out of the flock to be under observation for four days to make sure it was pure. And four days later, count it, Palm Sunday. Oh, I'm going to get people upset now. Palm Sunday uh, was the 10th of Nisan. Four days later is not Friday, Thursday. And Jesus was on the cross when the Passover lambs were being slain on the 14th of Nisan. So he was crucified on Thursday. I, I won't go into more details. If you don't like that, you can call our ministry. We'll give you all the documentation. But that's not what I'm talking about now. Okay, now go to uh, verse 14. This day shall be unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Okay, now let me ask you, who keeps the Passover? The Jews. Do the Arabs keep the Passover? No. They got, some, they got other holidays that they celebrate. Now, I'm going to say something that some of you are not going to like, but what does it say? Verse 14, this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast throughout your, your generations and so forth. We'll go on down to verse 25. It shall come to pass when you, be take, when you be come to the land, which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised, you shall keep this service, that is the Passover. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service? And they say, well, it's just a Jewish tradition, you know. No, you will say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses, and the people bowed their head and, the head and worshipped. This is a memorial. This is proof of the people who were once slaves, who were brought out by God's deliverance, and that land belongs to them. Okay, we give you other proofs, but I spent too much time on that. Well, let me just say, I don't know how many Jewish people we have here. Maybe some of you have kept the Seder, they like to call it that. I would not keep the Seder, because it plainly says the Passover is a memorial, and you're going to be able to tell your children, why are you doing this? Because we are descended. Our ancestors were delivered from Egypt, and this is proof. Now, if you've got so many Gentiles keeping this, it kind of messes the thing up, doesn't it? Uh, I think it's only for Jews, and it's my opinion, but I'm sure some of you will disagree. Okay, so, there's Israel. They're right in the middle of enemies. It's incredible. And... Well, I can tell you uh, uh, some things that probably, I'm sure you didn't read in the news. Uh, the Israeli satellites, uh, not too long ago, I think a year or two ago, 
um, detected a Syrian nuclear facility that had been brought in by the Chinese. And what did Israel do? Well, they can't mess around. Israel's getting awfully close, and they've got missiles. So what did Israel do? They checked with President Bush. Well, we'll give him credit. He did not consult the State Department, which has been anti-Israel from day one. Bush said, go ahead. They took it out. Uh, now, you didn't read of it in the newspaper because the Syrians would be ashamed and the uh, uh, Chinese would be ashamed to admit it. But anyway, Israel has acted with great restraint. But Damascus, and this dear brother was, who's a, in the Mossad, was saying, we came within a hair's breadth of nuking Damascus. And he, he's a Christian. And he read the, the um, passage in Isaiah that says, Damascus will become a heap of ruins. And he said, it almost happened, and it could happen. And we will probably be the ones who will have to do it. Okay, so they're gonna, they know how to deal with the um, Iranian nuclear threat and so forth. In fact, um, they just said that they've got 300 and, what is it, 360 centrifuges set up now. Uh, that's the second set. Uh, they had 360, however many it takes. You've got to have them all in, in concert. And you've got to have them all set up before you know whether things, the Israelis sabotaged every one of them. And when they set this up for the first test, Every one was cracked. They were of no value. Now, you didn't read that in the news either. But anyway, um, okay. The role of Israel in perilous times. God is using them to punish, punish the nations. I better move much more quickly. Wow. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe it. Uh, turn to Joel, chapter 3. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, chapter 3. Amazing prophecies. Verse 2. I, who's speaking, God, I will also gather all nations. People say to me, well, if I'm in Australia, they say, are they Australians? Is Australia in Bible prophecy? Yes. Is the United States in Bible prophecy? We just read it. I will gather all nations and I will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them, that means punish them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. I use these verses. You know, look, this prophecy conference, I, I guess, in some respects, not just to get some information, use it. I can, I can tell. I mean, I fly first class because I fly so many miles that they put me there. I sit next to CEOs of multinational corporations, CFOs and so forth. Uh, and when I say to them, you know, I, of course, we all know what's going on in the Middle East. Maybe we've got some big problems over there. Would you be surprised if I told you that the Bible prophesies this very situation, tells you how we got there? and tells you what the outcome is going to be, well, I guarantee you, they sit up and take notice. I use prophecy for uh, the gospel, to get unsaved people to listen. Okay, now, this is an amazing prophecy. Well, he's going to punish the nations for two things. Number one, they scattered my people among all the nations. Okay, well, that's been going on. That's anti-Semitism. Number two, they parted my land. And I don't have time to go into the details. Britain did it. They lost their empire. When they did that, they were, they were given the mandate to see that this became the home of the Jewish people. They betrayed the Jews for oil. They let the Arabs in, kept the Jews out. Okay, that's, I mean, 1945. Uh, there were 500,000 Hungarian Jews untouched by the Nazis. 
They offered to sell them for $2 a piece. No one would take them, not the United States. They went to the ovens. For $1 million, you could have saved 500,000 Jews from the ovens. But no one would rescue them, okay? The judgment of God is coming upon the nations. Hitler didn't do this alone. Hitler could not have acted alone. A lot of it was because of the uh, Catholic heritage of, of Germany and, and, and Europe, Poland and so forth. A thousand years of anti-Semitism on the part of the Catholic Church. And that prepared the way. But what about part of my land? Israel has been conquered by many nations. A nation doesn't divide up the land when they conquer the land. They keep it for themselves. First time in history, the land of Israel has been divided. Go to UN Resolution 181. It is entitled, The Partition of the Land. That's what it was all about. And by the way, it says that Jerusalem will be an international city forever, not under the control of the a Jewish people, Israelis. Well, how about that? Uh, Luke 21, 24, Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, I can tell you the Catholic Church had a lot to do with it, the United Nations and the United States. What is, the, you know, President Bush, he thinks he's doing well. I, I, I hope he does. He was given the original manuscript of this book placed personally into his hands before this was published. I don't know whether he ever read it. I was told to highlight some things for him and so forth. Uh, apparently it didn't mean anything. But he has the roadmap to peace. Well, what? look, Israel was divided. What is the basis of every proposed peace plan since Israel give them more land? Israel, give them more land. Roadmap to peace. Israel, give them more land. We just chased them uh, out, out of, um, help me, uh, out of what? Gaza. Gaza, thank you. And of course now it says Condoleezza Rice, who is a replacement theology, uh, that's her belief. West Bank is next, okay? We're just squeezing Israel back down to where well, wouldn't it be fair if we got back to that original uh, land that the UN divided up and gave them back then? Then there would be peace. No, the Arabs declared war because of that. We will destroy Israel. You're not going to get peace by going back there. Well, I probably overrun my time, although I haven't been given the signal. I'm easy to saying, yeah, I have overrun my time. Oh my goodness. Israel's prophetic role in perilous times. And we document it for you in here. Oh well, the United States, we've been there, friend. No, we have to some respects for military reasons, but the United States has betrayed Israel multiple times, militarily and so forth, and we document it for you in, in Judgment Day. Israel is the key. Watch Israel. Israel is going to punish the nations. The nations are trying to punish Israel, and they're going to be wiped out at Armageddon. And basically, that's kind of where we are. Father, thank you for your love. Lord, we know your word is true because we can prove it. You, you have said that you are the God of Israel. You're the God of Israel. You're the God of history. And you will prove your existence by telling us what's going to happen before it happens. And Lord, you have certainly done that. Father, help us to take the information that we have, the prophecies that we have, and to use them to awaken the unsaved and awaken, awaken Christians. And help us to use this to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.